Well, we have had some crazy weather here. I don't know if any of you periodically, out of curiosity, knowing that I'm based in Wisconsin, um, not England, as some of my recent subscribers have asked. For some reason, they thought I was located over in England. Not sure why, but anything's possible. Um, the weather we've had in Wisconsin has been crazy since Friday to today, which is Sunday, we've had about 16 inches of snow and there's been freezing rain and it's just been chaos. So this machine sitting on my workbench is still Michelle's or she also goes by Mickey. This is Mickey's machine that's going to be going out to North Carolina. I was hoping to ship it on Saturday, but as it became evident the type of weather we were going to have coming in on Friday, starting on Friday, I contacted her and I said, it's not going to happen. It's just going to be too dangerous to try to travel uh, with the machine to the post office and, you know, making it back and forth and everything. It just was going to be uh, an unnecessary risk. So she said, I get it. I, you know, I'm excited to get it, but, you know, if we can't ship it until Monday or so, that's fine. So that's what's going to happen. Weather permitting, we're supposed to continue. And as I speak, there's still snow falling now. Um, I'm hoping that I can get out to the post office tomorrow safely and get this machine uh, heading to the east out in North Carolina. Um, but actually it's worked out well because it's given me an opportunity. I've done a number of sew-offs, confirmation sew-offs off camera, but I didn't do them on camera. So I'm going to accomplish that today. The other thing I want to accomplish as well is I'd gotten a note from a gentleman uh, from the Netherlands. And I'm probably going to say his name wrong, so I apologize in advance if I pronounce it wrong. Uh, again, our, our channel is viewed in about a, almost 160 countries, so as I get notes and information from different people, I sometimes will say their name wrong uh, because I'm not knowledgeable about how to pronounce it uh, in that part of the world, so please forgive me for that. But this gentleman's name, his first name is Keys, K-E-E-S. So I'm going to pronounce it Keys, hopefully that's correct. And his last name is P-O-P-P-E-S, Poppies. Uh, so I'll just say Keys Poppies. And, and he'll probably tell me I said it wrong, and so I'm sorry. <laughs> but he had uh, contacted me for a couple reasons. One is he wanted to try to view the instructional videos that relate to the Husqvarna machines, and he couldn't do it in his country. And he thought, well, it's just specific to the Netherlands that there's an issue. It's actually worldwide. Uh, back in 2017, YouTube discontinued the opportunity for creators like me and others to present paid-for videos. Um, not sure exactly why they did it. Maybe it was an expense to them that they wanted to try to eliminate. But the instructional videos I had available then were no longer viewable. So I'm trying to work out, as I told him, uh, particulars right now that subscribers and interested parties will be able to pay me directly through PayPal, and then I'll send them a private link. I'm still trying to work out the wrinkles in that right now, so uh, it's not ready yet, but uh, hopefully we'll be soon. And his, his question that he was hoping to get answered was, how do I disassemble the upper tension control so I can clean it, make adjustments on it, etc.? So I'm not going to go in depth on this. I'm just going to show you quickly how to take it apart and then how to put it back together. Uh, and then I'll describe some basic tips on getting it clean, but it's, it's not going to be real, real in depth. It's going to be kind of hasty because the main purpose of this video is to show you what Michelle's machine can do, uh, the one that's going out to North Carolina. So bear with me. I'm going to zoom in on the tension control, uh, a, a, a separate tension control, and try to uh, give you some quick tips on what to do with this thing. So bear with me and I'll see hopefully if we can get you uh, on the right course my friend from the, ne the Netherlands so let's try to lock that in place so it doesn't move around too much there we go flip my screen and the first thing I'll show you is <clears throat> this tension control on the workbench right now you'll see that it looks there we go move that over a little bit You'll see that it looks different. This one is different than this one. And that's because the person that sent me this tension control with their machine obviously was trying to take it apart and they thought, well, the set screw is probably going to be on the end and that actually looks like a screw or a bolt, but that's just a mounting shaft for the upper tension. 
and so they broke the cap off you can see this one's not broken uh, this one is so I can tell you first of all don't try to disassemble it by taking the cap off the top of the tension control uh, the place to go to release this assembly so you can clean it and you can take it apart is this tiny little set screw down on the bottom the part that actually gets inserted into the machine and is closest to the release pin that's going to be as you raise your uh, your uh, basically your uh, presser foot uh, control as you bring that lever up and down it's going to push on this little pin on the end to either release or not release your tension control so that there's tension on that um, upper tension control. So this little pin gets pushed in every time you raise that presser foot lever and you lower it. It's either going to put tension on the discs or it's going to take off. So I'm going to take this little pin out. It actually comes out very easily and set it right here. And then I'm going to show you that I've got a small screwdriver and I'm going to insert it into this little screw that's on the end of the tension, con the upper tension control that goes into the machine. And as you turn that to the left, it's going to allow this tension assembly to come apart. So you're going to want to have one finger on top and your thumb on the bottom so that this thing doesn't pop apart on you. Okay? So just turn that little screw to the left. As we say in America, lefty loosey, righty tighty. So you're going to turn it about two turns or so. You don't need much more than that. Uh, turn it to the left. And then you're going to see, I'll give it one more turn. You're going to see all of a sudden it's loose. See that? And as we take it apart, you're going to see that there's two primary parts. This bottom part where the, the spring is that's going to really be a central part of maintaining tension as you're sewing. So as I hold it down here, it's probably easier for you to see. You can push that down. And inside of here, there's a spring that's embedded into this bottom part of the assembly. And as you're looking at it like this, this is basically how it would sit on your machine. You can see your spring would be on the left, and then this would be your center point up here. And when we reassemble this, this center point, it's going to be important that that zero is going to be to the right of that center point. So as you increase tension and you turn it uh, to the right, um, that assembly is going to operate properly. So I'm going to set this down. And you're going to see on the bottom, we got this bottom half. It's basically going to comprise of that bolt that you can see sticking out on this end. And then it's going to have three main components. I'm going to slide them all off at the same time. It's going to have a disc on top that's facing down. The shiny part's going to face down, obviously. It's going to have a center point here that's going to be between the two discs. And the reason that this center piece is there is because this upper tension control is equipped to support dual needle sewing. So you basically would have one disc on one side of this assembly and then this other disc that we just took off on the other side of this assembly like a sandwich like this. See? and there could be thread feeding on either side of that centerpiece. And then on the bottom, you're going to see that we have another spring that's going to be basically mounted right into the top of that knob. If I turn it like that, you can see there's the top of the knob, all the little numbers. And the thing you won't be able to see on camera very easily is this little bolt that sticks here that everything mounts on down on the bottom on the inside of the knob there's a tiny little hole and that hole is important because on this end of the spring there's a little point coming off the bottom of the spring this little point needs to go into that hole that's on the inside of this plastic tension control so I'm going to slide it over again and you'll be able to see it when you look at your own so it basically immobilizes this spring so that spring can't rotate from side to side. That little uh, metal tip goes into the back of this uh, tension control and it immobilizes it. This part, all of these parts, can be swabbed gently with a Q-tip and some rubbing alcohol. 
you do not want to, one of the things that my friend from the Netherlands asked, Keys, uh, he said, do I need to lubricate or grease this tension control? The answer is absolutely not. Don't put any grease, don't put any oil on it. We want to actually take all of the oil off of it so that it's bare, clean metal, it's nice and slippery and smooth, and it allows that upper tension to function as it was designed to do. Okay, so as we reassemble this, the first thing you're going to see is one of these tension discs has a little center tab sticking out. Let me see if I can face it towards the camera. It has a little center tab that's going to be on the bottom. As you're looking at this assembly, see if I can, yep, I've got that positioned pretty well. You're going to want to slide that on first with the smooth part up after you've cleaned it. Our little center piece, as you're looking at this tension control, you're going to want to orientate it so that that stop point that I talked about, that little little uh, arrow type uh, plastic piece that sticks up, I'll keep that orientated towards the front because your goal as you reassemble this is you want this center piece, number one you're going to see there's a little tiny tab on it, you want that tab to be pointing up and you want that arrow, and I'm describing this as an arrow shape, to be pointing to the right just as it should be when it's mounted. Okay. And then we're going to add our other disc with the smooth side pointing down so that as we get it together, it's going to look basically like this. Okay, That's our little, our little stop point is right here on top. You can see the 0, the 9, and our little arrow which basically serves as a retainer stop point once we put the other piece together. We want to keep that arrow pointing to the right, pointing to the right. We want to keep uh, all of these pieces kind of rigid as we slide them back together. So this bottom piece again, that spring is obviously going to be pointing to the left. Arrow to the right, spring to the right. Uh, sorry, spring to the left, arrow to the right. Uh, get my directions straight here. And as we bring it together, we're going to be using our thumb to kind of push that bolt in and up so that the tension is nice and snug. And again, the stop point, I hope you can see it in the camera, our zero has to be to the right of that part right there, that little tab piece on the bottom part of the tension control so that we can operate it properly. We have to rotate it to the right, obviously, to increase tension. And so that means with a stop point there, that has to be so we can adjust the tension with the zero being to the right, but there's a little tab just to the right of the zero, and that needs to be past this point right here. Okay? I hope I'm not utterly confusing you. If I am, send me a nasty note or something. Okay, at this point, we want to keep tension on this. We want to take our pin that's going to allow tension to release and slide it back into place because as this tension rotates, at some point that shaft with that opening is going to come to this point, and if that pin isn't in there, your whole tension control is going to come apart. I'm going to try to rotate this, hopefully, so you can see it. So now we're going to take our screwdriver, we're going to screw that back in, not super tight, but just tight enough that it's going to hold our tension control together again. Okay? Our pin's in there, everything has been clean, and at this point we can move our dial back and forth we've succeeded, okay? All right, I got to move on. I probably took a lot more time on that than I should have, but I wanted to answer uh, my friend from the Netherlands question about how do you take this silly thing apart and not allow him to break it uh, as the customer that had sent me that one where they were trying to access it from the top, which was not correct. Okay, so let me adjust my camera angle, zoom back out again, and we're going to jump into Michelle's machine, Mickey's machine, and show you what this beautiful Swedish beauty can do uh, from a heavy duty standpoint. Okay, so I'm going to get my camera angle down towards that needle and go the other way, Scott. <laughs> All right, that should be pretty good right there, I think. All right, flip my screen around. The other thing you'll notice is I have a totally different attachment on there. 
I told Michelle I wanted to give her a nice little pack of attachments to kind of start her out with. And I didn't specifically focus on those, but if I want to accomplish that real quick before I jump into things, I can kind of drop the camera down. You can see we have a variety of attachments there um, that she can mess around with. I'm not a big attachment guy, but I know that they're important to my customers, so I always try to give them a nice variety uh, to play around with. And the manual uh, is certainly going to cover that. Um, <clears throat> as I pointed out to Mickey, um, with one of the uh, videos on my YouTube channel, actually many of my videos, I will usually in the description portion, portion provide a link that takes you to my Dropbox so that you can download manuals for free. There's folks online that are trying to get 10, 15, sometimes even 20 bucks for a manual. And so as I've acquired manuals and I've been able to uh, get them into a PDF format, I try to put them on the YouTube channel. So if you're curious about whether or not a manual is available for a particular machine, go to the description within that YouTube video and you may be lucky and you may find a free link so you can download that manual at no cost. I've had many of you contact me and ask about buying them. I don't want to charge you for them. I'd rather just give them to you if I've got them. So, okay. So let me get over by the machine now. <clears throat> and um, we'll see if we can have a little bit of fun showing you what this 21A can do as far as heavy duty sewing. The first thing I'd like to show you is I've got some genuine cowhide and this stuff is anything but lightweight. Uh, this is the thick of thick. You can see from the side, I mean, it's just got a grain to it that says, yeah, uh, let's see if you can get through me, basically. And we're going to go ahead and do that right now. We're going to go through it with a straight stitch. Isn't that kind of fun? See how that little wheel uh, rolls? It's basically uh, going to give you a little bit more control over heavy grade materials and it's going to give you a little bit more stability when it comes to sewing. So we're going to zip down this, hopefully, uh, with a simple straight stitch. And uh, show you what this uh, machine is capable of doing after it went through a full restorative process on my workbench. Here we go. I was good, as usual. <laughs> All right, let me give this a clip and we'll take a look and see what this machine that's gonna head out to Mickey in North Carolina was able to do with this material. This full is basically genuine cowhide and uh, you can see on top our stitch is extremely well defined. I can turn it like this as well so you can look at it like this. The spacing, the formation, everything about that stitch is just absolutely spot on. It looks really, really good. And as we turn it over, it's kind of hard to see unless I were to zoom in real close, which I can do at the, I can certainly do at the end. But that stitch definition on the back side as well is absolutely gorgeous. That lock-in stitch is, is looking really, really fine on this genuine cowhide. And again, look at it from the side. You're looking at about six, six to seven, I would say, ounces of genuine cowhide leather. And this machine, well, you, you heard it yourself. It went through it like, what's the big deal? Matter of fact, let's double our stakes. Let's be a little bit daring today. I've been daring out in the elements, out in the yucky Wisconsin weather that we've had with all that snow and freezing rain. Let's see if we can double our stakes and go through two layers of this genuine cowhide leather. We're looking at, with this, probably close to 14 ounces of genuine cowhide leather. I hope I'm not biting off more than I can chew. I'm going to see if I can slide this underneath this roller foot, and we're going to go right down the middle of those stitches that we just laid down, okay? So keep your fingers crossed. Again, I hope I didn't promise more than I can deliver. I don't think so. So let's see what this wonderful machine can do. Again, Husqvarna 21A, 1.5 amps. Let's get her done. Here we go. Wow. 
What do you think? Did you hear the machine strain or groan or say, Oh my gosh, what are we going to do with this? Not even close, not even for a second. We clip these threads and show you what this wonderful machine that's heading out to Mickey in North Carolina did. There's our stitch right down the middle that we just put down. Everything about that stitch, just like the other stitch that we did through the single layer on the outside, is absolutely spot on. The stitch quality, the formation, the spacing, no missed stitches. It just went through it and said, boom, done. If I turn it over, that lock and stitch right down the middle here as well is just spectacular. Everything about that, the spacing, the formation, and look at it from the side, what we just went through. I'm going to try to find, this is probably a fairly good portion over here to show you the thickness of what we just did. That is crazy nuts thick right there. It's absolutely crazy. Again, I would say conservatively 14 ounces, probably even closer to 16 ounces of genuine cowhide leather. I mean, look at that stuff. We did, we did the equivalent of just making a gun holster or uh, a portion of the saddle. Look at it from this angle as well. Holy mackerel. And, you know, like I've said before, so what if you if you go through something and you can get through it is one thing and as I was brushing that I saw that I just unthreaded my needle uh, just brushed by it so I'll have to rethread that real quick on camera but you know what it is what it is and again crazy what what that thing just accomplished okay so bear with me for a second as I get this needle rethreaded I I ran that leather behind it and uh, kind of sabotaged myself so See if I can get her threaded up again real quick and we'll jump right in, into the next uh, sew off. So yeah, the weather we've been having here is just beyond measure. Even for hardcore Wisconsinites, it has been weather that has been unprecedented uh, for this area. As far as the amount of weather you get in this short of a period of a time, uh, to have this amount of snowfall uh, this quickly has just been absolutely insane for this area. So any of you that are in warmer climate areas, you can chuckle a little bit as we uh, try to weather the storm, particularly weathering the storm when you're talking about uh, the April time period, you, you just don't expect to get weather like this, not even in Wisconsin. And I usually don't have any trouble threading the needle. And of course, since I'm trying to do this as I'm recording, it's going to give me a hard time. <laughs> ah! I think I finally got it. Good gravy. Okay, I better not get material too close. And again, with this type of foot, you have to kind of then take that thread and bring it down into that center point where the needle travels so you can then benefit from that presser foot pressure going over the top of that thread. Okay, that was an unexpected pleasure as I was just trying to thread a needle on camera. Okay, what I want to sew off on now is some of this genuine U.S. Army canvas. I've got two layers to start. I'm going to go ahead and fold it over. We're up to four layers. And then finally, I'm going to fold it one more time. We're up to six layers of genuine U.S. Army canvas. If you think this is easy, try it on your, try it on your machine. Uh, it's anything but easy. So I'm going to go ahead and slide it underneath that presser foot. And let's see what this uh, machine can do. And why don't we make it a little bit fun? I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring my lights down so you can really see the, the action at the needle. And <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and throw a little bit of a zigzag. I wouldn't say a big zigzag in there, just to raise the stakes even higher. So here we go. Um, a modified zigzag through six layers of U.S. Army grade canvas. Here we go.
taking it slow and we'll speed up a little bit at the end so what do you think did you hear Mickey's machine struggle did you hear it strain did you hear it groan nope and yet others that have sent me their Husqvarna's when that machine lands on my workbench there's no way in God's green earth you're gonna get it to do that so there's the stitch we just did I wanted to raise the stakes a little bit and have a little bit of fun so we have kind of a modified zigzag and we just went through six layers of US Army grade canvas not even a lick of trouble from this machine the machine just got it done like what's the big deal and I see that I gotta go through bear with me for a second there we go pull these threads through so not even a lick of trouble in going through there if we turn it over our lock stitch looks just as great and again look at what we just went through six layers of US Army grade canvas not even an effort for this machine so let's go on to the next thing what can we do next why don't we do some denim I've got some heavy grade denim right here I've got it folded I've got two layers right now I'm gonna kinda go like this I think two layers I'm gonna go ahead and fold it we're up to four layers I'm gonna fold it one more time and just like the canvas now we're up to did I do six layers or eight layers one two three four five six six layers of heavy grade denim so I'm gonna slide that underneath our roller foot and let's see what this 21a again 1.5 amp motor can do with this much denim now I get it you're not likely to be sewing this many layers of denim some of you might be because some of the customers that buy my machines are looking to sew purses and sometimes they're going to be going through this many layers as you look at putting the different components and parts of that purse together so I don't think it's a wasted effort showing you that this 21a can go through this many layers of heavy grade denim six layers and this is absolutely the thick of thick and I think just so that you don't send me a note later saying well why did you go to a straight stitch on that when you did a zigzag on the US Army grade canvas I'm gonna leave it on the zigzag for this so off now alright here we go six layers of heavy grade denim I barely even have that foot control down barely even have it down and it just plows through that and we're not even using the slow gear we're just using standard sewing and you can see because I have that as a modified zigzag depending on the material and the density of that material it's going to manipulate the look of that stitch a little bit you can see this looks different obviously than when we did the US Army grade canvas there's the canvas here's the denim they're pretty close but they're slightly different again because of the depth and the density of that material so beautiful stitch as usual we turn it over like this let me see which ends gonna work better from this angle probably this side you can see again six layers of denim that is crazy if you tried this on a machine from your local retailer like Walmart or something busted plastic parts everywhere and as we turn it over this again is going to be our top stitch we turn it over look at that lock-in stitch it's spectacular in every respect the spacing the formation the consistency of that stitch all the way across it's as good as it gets so no challenge there either with six layers of heavy grade denim I'm gonna move on now to some more leather we kind of started out with cowhide leather I'm going to go to some garment leather now. We've got two layers of this garment leather right now. I'm going to go ahead and fold it in half, and we're going to end up going through the equivalent. can kind of show it here. The equivalent of four layers of this garment leather. This is genuine leather. It's just used for clothing because of the sheenness and because of the, the, the manufacturing of it. It just makes it more appropriate for clothing. But it's no easier to get through. So I'm going to go ahead and slide it underneath that roller foot and get it into place and we're going to go ahead and zip down four layers of this garment leather okay here we go i 
I wish I could challenge this machine. I really do. But after it gets done going through my restorative process, there's not much that can challenge whether it's a Husqvarna or any of the other machines that hit this workbench, quite honestly. So look at that. I love the way red presents on black, don't you? It's absolutely spectacular in every respect. I'm going to try to bring my light in a little bit more so I get some nice light on those stitches. Those are absolutely drop dead gorgeous. And you know what? Any of you that are experienced sewers, you already know as you go through multiple layers of leather like this with a straight stitch, that's enough of a challenge. When you raise the stakes by going to a zigzag, a modified zigzag through this stuff, and you're, you're, you're turning it over and you're going, well, I might see some issues as far as that lock stitch. Not in this machine, you won't. Look at that. That lock stitch looks just as spectacular. The spacing, the formation, everything about it is absolutely spot on on this 21A. Absolutely a gorgeous stitch. What are we going to do now? <laughs> we're not finding any challenge for this machine. We're simply not. So we're going to go to vegetable tan leather now. Two layers of it. Because as I've said before, vegetable tan leather, look at, look at the back as well. You can see the grain of that is just like, yeah, try to go through me. Give it, a, give it a shot, Scott. Well, we're going to give it a shot. And not just one layer. We're going to go through two layers. As you can see, when I hold it still like that, you're looking at about six to eight ounces, six to eight ounces of vegetable tan leather that is ridiculously thick. So I'm going to go ahead and slide it under this really cool roller attachment, get it into position. And I don't want to get stuck on a zigzag. I just don't. So I am going to take this one with a straight stitch and we'll shorten up that stitch just a little bit to give it more of a challenge. Okay? All right, two layers of vegetable tan leather, about eight ounces. Here we go. 